Hello everyone and welcome to the 1800 Respect webinar series. Today's topic is technology, stalking and domestic violence. What is it and how your clients can stay safe? 1800 Respect is pleased to welcome your presenter, Dr Delaney Woodlock from Domestic Violence Resource Centre, Victoria. Dr Delaney Woodlock is a researcher in the areas of violence against women and women's health. She does project work at DVRCV, including research on violence against women with disabilities and technology facilitated abuse. Her PhD is in sociology centred on young women's experiences of mental illness and antidepressants in Australia and explored the impacts of sexual violence on their mental health. I'd now like to pass you over to Delaney to begin. Hey everyone, so today I'm going to take you through some of the Domestic Violence Resource Centre Victoria or DVRCV research findings on technology and abuse and explore some of our resources on tech safety for women. DVRCV aims to prevent domestic violence by providing professional training, publications and resources for the general community. A critical part of our work is bridging the gap between research and practice. Our focus is to develop research projects that have usable and practical outcomes. Our Smart Safe research was designed as an inquiry into technology facilitated stalking in the context of domestic violence. This presentation will focus on surveys we conducted with 152 domestic violence workers and 46 victim survivors. The number of workers who participated reflects a sizable sample of the Victorian domestic violence sector. However, because it is a relatively small scale study in terms of the number of victim survivors who participated, we recognise that these findings are not necessarily representative or conclusive. Nevertheless, our research shows that for workers and victim survivors in Victoria, there are serious concerns about the use of technology in the context of domestic violence. We believe it is important that the results from research are communicated in an accessible way to those who can incorporate the findings into their work. Thus, our focus here is on what can assist practice, provide awareness and increase knowledge for domestic violence sector workers, which will ultimately improve outcomes for women experiencing violence. We also want to ensure that our outcomes honour the input of survivors. Therefore, our resource development is a direct reflection of their contribution to our project. For example, survivors told us that they needed to know more about legal options, so we developed easy legal guides to provide more information about the way that the law can help them with technology facilitated stalking and abuse. In this presentation, I'll explore the findings of our surveys, but I'll also provide some examples of the resources that we developed based on this research. DVRCV was one of the first domestic violence organisations in the world to have an online presence, such as our website. Our experiences in providing online resources have demonstrated that technology can be used in ways that benefit victim survivors of violence. However, we've become increasingly aware of the way that perpetrators may exploit the data trails left by technology, for example, by tracking women's website histories. Over the past few years, we've been contacted by women who were being abused and harassed by their mobile phones. Service providers have also contacted us for advice on how to assist women who are being tracked and stalked using smartphone technology. In 2012, we successfully applied for funding from Victoria Legal Aid to conduct research into technology facilitated abuse. Our goal was to investigate the ways that mobile technologies are being used by perpetrators to stalk and abuse women, as well as how these technologies may be used to improve women's safety, such as by collecting evidence of intervention order breaches. While our research looks at all technology facilitated stalking, we put a, we put a particular focus on smartphones. This is due to the increasing use of smartphones to access the internet, with studies showing that more people are using their mobile devices to access the web, such as um, Facebook, than their computers. We hope that this smart safe research will help fill the gaps in our knowledge and build the evidence base so that we can effectively prevent the misuse of mobile technologies by perpetrators. We also want to enable women to be able to safely use these technologies. So before I get uh, into our findings, I just want to briefly explore what partner stalking is. So stalking encompasses a pattern of repeated, frequently intrusive behaviours such as following, harassing, monitoring and threats that intimidate and cause fear in recipients. 
Within the context of domestic violence, stalking tends to be a form of abusive behaviour which perpetrators use at the end of a relationship in an attempt to control the victim. However, studies are emerging that show that stalking behaviours are often part of the relationship before separation. And you can see here on your screen that stalking behaviours are common in Australia, with one in five women experiencing stalking. And you can see that uh, men are the main perpetrators of stalking in Australia and internationally. And when men are stalked, they're usually more likely to be stalked by another man. And women are most likely to be the victims of stalking. And in terms of partner stalking in the context of domestic violence, women are overwhelmingly the victims. So we'll now move into exploring our findings from our survey with domestic violence sector workers. The strong response to our survey, 152 domestic violence workers, reflected significant concern about the abuse of technology in the context of domestic violence. These participants worked in a variety of areas, including case management, crisis response, housing, policy and legislation. The average length of time that they had been working in the sector was 5.5 years. So I think we have a poll now. So we're asking, uh, is intimate partner stalking less dangerous than stalking by a non-partner? Something that only occurs when a relationship has ended? Or is it a risk factor for serious violence, including sexual violence and homicide? So it looks like most people are choosing the right answer. I won't say the answer yet, but that's really good. Yep, and some answers are still coming in. Okay, I think we've probably got Almost all the answers there. All right. So we'll stop the poll there. And um, the right answer was that it is a risk factor for serious violence, including sexual violence and homicide. So we're going to go in and explore that a little bit more now. Okay, so first of all we asked uh, domestic violence workers some general questions about their views of stalking and domestic violence. So for example, if they felt that stalking was an issue for women in the context of domestic violence and if there was enough protection for women experiencing stalking. You can see here that our findings show that workers felt that stalking was an issue and not only did they feel that stalking was not taken seriously, but also that women themselves were not sure about what sort of behaviour constitutes stalking. Research conducted in the past few years shows that while stalking by partners is a risk factor, as we saw, for um, serious violence, including sexual violence and homicide, it is often not taken seriously. Stalking has been linked to an increased risk of homicide, with one study finding that 68% of women experience stalking within 12 months of an attempted or actual homicide. Partner stalking can occur for many years, often lasting longer than stalking by strangers and acquaintances. A national US survey found that cases involving intimates lasted 2.2 years on average compared to one year by stalking from others. However, an Australian study found that police and many in the general community perceive partner stalking as less, as less serious than stranger stalking. The so domestic violence workers reported that in their experience, perpetrators are utilising mobile technologies as part of their stalking tactics. And they provided us with various examples of how these technologies were being used. And as you can see here, 97% of workers stated that perpetrators were using technology. And next we can see the, the kinds of technologies that they felt were being used to stalk women. So the most common were smartphones and mobile phones. And then um, social media, particularly Facebook, and you can see lower numbers um, of GPS tracking. Okay, 
So in our research, we asked workers for examples of technology facilitated stalking that they had identified from their work with women. By analysing the wide range of responses, we were able to categorise our findings into three major themes based on what appeared to be the main way that perpetrators were using technology to facilitate their stalking. And these major themes were causing fear, omnipresence and punish and humiliate. So now I'm going to go just a little bit more into depth about what workers said um, about these three major tactics. So all stalking tactics have the intent to cause fear. But this fear can be heightened when mobile technologies are used as women often have their devices with them 24 hours a day, enabling the perpetrator almost constant access to her life. So here are some of the quotes from workers. Stalkers can keep sending SMS after SMS. If their mobile number is blocked, they can just change their number. There are also a number of free messaging services that can be used on a smartphone. These cost nothing and allow a person to keep sending message after message. Generally, it is another layer of control and imitation in their repertoire. Text messages that profess their love after serious violence are fairly common. There are also threatening text messages and voicemail. Sometimes the two are interspersed, creating an emotional roller coaster for the victim. I have had one client who has been stalked by her ex-husband via her smartphone. She's tried various tactics to elude him, such as changing her number, but he seems to be able to track her down each time. He uses technology to abuse and threaten her and also to track her whereabouts. He also contacts their children via their tablet and sends abusive texts about the client. Women are being tethered by the use of technology and monitored. So the next major tactic we found was omnipresence. Researchers have found that one of the most terrifying tactics used by stalkers is to make the victim feel that she has no privacy, security or safety and that the stalker knows and sees everything. Mobile technologies enable perpetrators to create the sense that they are present in every aspect of the victim's life. This tactic also erodes the spatial boundaries of the relationship, so that even though a woman may have physically separated from her partner, she is unable to completely escape his presence in her life. Workers reported that perpetrators used numerous ways to create this sense of omnipresence in victim survivors' lives. For example, some workers mentioned tracking by GPS. A past client was under a great array of electronic surveillance. Her partner had installed a tracking device in her car and would text her and let her know that he was aware of her location. She had the GPS disabled on her phone, but this persisted. Also, after engaging a person to repair the front gate, it was discovered that her ex-partner had installed covert cameras both in the home and at the front gate that he had linked to his computer. We also found that proxy stalking was very common where perpetrators used other people to contact victim survivors, which conveyed the sense that women were never really safe, that he is able to contact her regardless of any intervention order. This can also heighten her feelings of isolation and that she's being ganged up on in some way. The social networking sites are being used quite a bit. Sometimes it will be a status update blaming his problems on her or calling her names and accusing her of embarrassing, shameful behaviour. It seems that the truly hurtful aspect of this is a comment of support to him from family and friends that leaves the victim feeling like she's being ganged up on by an entire community. This is incredibly intimidating. Facebook can also be utilised to cause women to feel that her partner or ex-partner knows and sees everything she is doing. Even if a woman has blocked her partner or ex-partner from a Facebook account, he still may be able to monitor her through Facebook pages of shared friends and family or even their children's accounts. I've had two clients who have had to relocate and change their names, but it's still being found by stalking the client's friends on Facebook. So the next, the next major tactics that, tactic that workers identified being used was the use of technology to punish and humiliate women. An intimate partner stalker often knows his victim's greatest fears, concerns and secrets, and will use this knowledge to punish, torment and humiliate her. While perpetrators have long used this tactic, with mobile technologies, it can now be done easily and immediately by broadcasting humiliating content to friends, family and the community. There's been limited study into the use of technology in sharing or threatening to share sexually explicit messages or sexting in the, con in the context of domestic violence. However, anecdotal evidence provided to a Victorian Law Reform Committee stated that mobile images and videos 
and these were either consensually provided or under coercion of women were being used by perpetrators to threaten and control domestic violence victims. Our research supports these anecdotal claims as some of these quotes and our quotes from victim survivors in our next section will show. So I'll just go through some of these quotes. Video cameras have been hidden in a bathroom or bedroom. YouTube videos taken when unaware and put on YouTube. Recording sexual activities and then threatening to post or actually posting them online. Slanderous information about a woman sent via Facebook to her new partner by her ex-partner sister. Video of her doing a seductive dance shown to her children by her ex and used to degrade her to them. Threats sent via Facebook and most of these are done in breach of an intervention order. Women are having their Facebook page hacked into a nasty thing written about and to them. One particular woman had her ex-partner saturate her page with information about how he gave her an STI. This information was read by her teenage son's friends amongst other people. Many situations I have encountered involve men monitoring women's status updates on Facebook and then using this information to inflict injury on women or in their mind punish them for their transgression. So now I'll just summarise our workers' findings. So the large number of participants, 152 workers, enabled us to form a picture of the way mobile technologies were providing perpetrators with further opportunities to stalk and abuse women. Our survey found that mobile technologies allow perpetrators access to victim survivors 24 hours a day. Perpetrators are using mobile technologies to abuse and harass women easily, instantaneously and at a distance. Perpetrators are using technology to create a sense of omnipresence in women's lives. And mobile technologies are being used as an easy way for perpetrators to punish and humiliate women. So now I'll, ne I'll now move on to explore the findings of our survey with victim survivors. Our online survey with victim survivors had 46 participants. The average age of participant was 35. This is noteworthy suggesting that despite widespread perception that technology facilitated abuse is occurring mainly amongst young people, our research shows that it's happening to older demographics as well. And we can just add their little profile of um, the women who participated in our survey. And I think we have a poll now. So what do you think is the most commonly use technology by perpetrators to abuse women. Um, so we've got their GPS tracking, Facebook or text messages. I think that's what we've got. Um, a lot of the right answer coming here, which is good. All right, I think we probably got enough of the answers there. So the right answer was text messages. Um, and interestingly though, a new study that's just come out in the US is actually showing there that um, GPS tracking is being used quite a bit. So um, we're predicting that maybe that is something that will start to occur more here. And as you'll see, I'll go more into our findings of the specific technology next, but that actually was not found a lot here. So thanks. So we'll move on to the next slide. Okay. So first of all, we asked women about their stalking experiences in general. And you can see here that 80% reported that they had received text messages that made them feel afraid. They were also made to feel that the perpetrator was tracking them and over 50% felt that they were being followed. Previous research in the US on domestic violence and technology also found that the use of text messages to harass women was extremely common. Researchers felt that this may be due to the fact that blocking text messages is actually quite a difficult process on most mobile phones and with most mobile networks. So women were asked to note the specific ways that they had been abused and harassed using mobile technology. The responses show that while text messaging was the most commonly experienced technology used in abuse, many had also experienced a range of other technology-based tactics. So including having their private pictures of them shared without permission, 
and having their location tracked with technology. So women were asked to provide more details about the technology facilitated abuse aid experience. And we found the same themes emerged in women's experiences as we saw in workers' answers about how perpetrators were using technology to facilitate their stalking and abuse. So that was uh, causing fear, omnipresence, and punish and humiliate. The women's experiences also show just how much crossover there is between these tactics. The perpetrators will often use multiple tactics to abuse and harass women. So we can see the first tactic was um, causing fear. So workers, sorry, women reported that they were being made to feel afraid through threats made via phone calls and text messages. It is important to remember that research has found a strong association between stalking and lethal or near lethal violence. In particular, unwanted phone calls from violent ex-partners have been linked to an increased risk of homicide. Therefore, it is important that technology facilitated abuse, such as experience, that experienced by the women in our research, is taken seriously. Okay, so before I get into the um, answers, we've got a question. Um, so Michelle's asking, is this only an issue for young women who use mobile phones, tablets, and com computers more? Um, we're not exactly sure about that, so we didn't go necessarily into depth um, about certain demographics, but um, that that could well be, yeah. Okay, so I'll go into our answers now. The women said that he would constantly text me to check up on me during our relationship. This behaviour escalated when we broke up. I would get over 100 abusive texts a day. I never felt free of him. Much of the texts were threatening, especially regarding sexual things, which was particularly shameful and painful. During our relationship, I could never use my phone in front of him because he would always ask what I was doing and he would want me to show him. He would then tell me what to say to the person I was texting. It was as though he never liked me being on the phone unless it was to communicate with him. He bombarded me with text messages after I left him. His text messages were mostly of threats towards my family. There was more than one occasion where he wouldn't stop calling me if he found out where if he found out I lied to him about where I was. Turning off my phone wasn't an option because I knew I would get into trouble if I kept ignoring his calls. Women who responded to our survey reported that perpetrators were utilising mobile technology to create a relentless presence in their lives. This included tracking women using GPS, making women feel that they were being followed and constant text messaging. I suspect he may have installed software onto my iPhone, enabling him to have access to my phone calls, text messages, Facebook, email, etc. He sometimes says things or behaves in ways that suggest he knows something via a suspicious means. I've had my ex trace phone records when number was changed and obtained last 10 calls I'd made with that number with the phone company. He also pretended to be a female on Facebook, contacting my new partner's brother to get info on me. He texted me at all hours and called constantly. My ex used to track me with GPS. I felt afraid to tell him to stop doing this. It also, this also made it so hard to leave him and I had to get a new phone and lose all those contacts. He was also very violent in other ways, physical and he would force me to do sexual things. He would send me up to 50 texts a day with horrible and graphic details of what he was going to do to me. He harassed my family to try to find me, but I've moved states, losing contacts with most of my support to be free of him. And the next tactic was um, punish and humiliate. So women reported that perpetrators often threatened to use technology to publicly shame them in front of their family and friends. In some cases, the perpetrator carried out these threats. Several women also mentioned the sexualized aspect of this abuse. My ex would text me pornographic pictures, text me things that were very sexual in nature. After we split up, this just intensified. 
I was terrified each time I had a text coming through. I tried to block his number, but I didn't want to change my number as I didn't want him to impact me in that way. Eventually, I did have to change all my numbers, which was sad, but I just couldn't take it any longer. He would track my movements using Facebook, internet banking and email, would send messages or call verbally abusing me for what he had seen on the internet. My ex-partner harassed and stalked me for the last four years. He has breached intervention orders constantly. He has contacted colleagues and friends via Facebook and email consistently during this time, as well as myself. He has spread rumours about myself and my fiancé that could have damaged our business, and he has made public calls and pages on Facebook for people to come and take our child from me so that I get what I deserve. In between these incidents of abuse, he has proposed marriage to me, begged me to go back to him and sent me gifts. He has previously broken into my home. I move cities and he does not currently know my address but still contacts my friends, etc. to find out my whereabouts. I report everything to the police. So partner stalking has been found to be linked to a risk of experiencing other forms of domestic violence and emotionally abusive or controlling behaviour. Emerging research shows a link between stalking and in particular sexual violence. Our research findings are consistent with this research. So as you can see here, as well as stalking, many women reported experiencing other forms of violent behaviour, including emotional and sexual abuse. We asked participants if the unwanted contact they'd experienced had an impact on their mental health and wellbeing. And you can see here that 84% said it had. Uh, and you can also read here in the cloud um, that the impact that it had on victim survivors. So, these effects were terrible nightmares, panic attacks, severe depression, feeling like they always had to be on high alert, um, not being able to sleep well, and getting fearful that they'd be tracked down. The next questions we asked participants uh, looked at if the unwanted contact they'd experienced, um, if they had sought help for this abuse. And you can see here that 56% did not seek help and 44% did. When women did seek help, we found that the majority went uh, to family and friends and a smaller amount went to domestic violence services, police, legal services and helpline. Of the 44% of women who stated that they did seek help, only 30% indicated that they took out intervention orders. And we can see here that when asked if they felt the intervention order was helpful, 50% said no. And um, we asked women about their experiences with intervention orders, so I'll just quickly cover um, what women said about their experiences with intervention orders. So having the courage to actually apply for an order is a huge barrier in the process. Admitting the problem and facing the process and some police members is a really daunting and difficult process. At times you are treated as though it is your fault. The order did stop the contact, but it doesn't remove the fear. My former partner now lives interstate because of an undertaking he gave to the court, but I'm constantly aware that he could turn up at any time. It would seem that the fear and being on edge never leaves you. The harassment has continued, especially via online avenues for years. It seems anything online is much more difficult for the police to prove and take to court, and it seems to be not taken as seriously. I felt the whole process was confusing, unsure exactly what I could and couldn't do, particularly regarding the children. I also didn't feel that I was safe and that breaches were taken seriously. So now I um, will go through a summary of the findings of our survey with victim survivors. So you can see that um, a wide variety of technology is being used in partner stalking, including text messaging, social media, GPS, and photo and video technology. Technology is often used in stalking both during the relationship and after separation. Technology is used by perpetrators to publicly and publicly uh, humiliate and shame women, often in sexualized ways. 
The use of technology in stalking has an impact on women's mental well-being. Women who have experienced technology facilitated stalking have often experienced other forms of domestic violence, including emotional, financial and sexual abuse. When women do seek legal help by taking out an intervention order, it is not always effective in stopping perpetrators from stalking women via mobile technology. So as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, DVRCV aims to conduct research that is usable and practical, that has usable and practical outcomes that can directly inform practice and by extension improve the lives of women experiencing violence. So I'll now explore briefly some of the resources we we, we developed as an outcome of this research. Um, I'll just wait till I get to the video, just explain the video first. So we created a series of how-to videos on how to minimise the possibilities of a phone being tracked and also how to assist women with collecting any evidence of intervention or the breaches with their phones, such as how to take screenshots of text messages. So I'll now show you a video we created to assist workers and women with the steps they need to take to minimise the possibilities of a phone being tracked when women are in an immediate safety risk. Okay, so we can now show you this video. In order to minimise the possibility of a phone being tracked, important to check that certain, important settings to check are certain settings are turned off. On an iPhone, you need to find, the, iPhone, you need to find the settings. Once you have found that, you, once can, you scroll have found that, you can scroll to privacy. Open this up and you will open find, up and you will find location services. Check that this is turned Check off, that this is turned by, off opening by opening up the setting. Up the setting. Then, clicking then clicking off. You will get an you will alert, get an alert telling, you telling you that the phone, that the phone will no longer be able to be, able to be, found, to be on found on a map. On a map. Choose, turn, Choose off. turn off. You then click, you then back, click on back on privacy, back on, back settings. on settings, scroll up, scroll slightly, up slightly and now and click on general. From the general, From the general section, section, we want to, we want to, to now turn, turn off cellular, cellular data. data. Cellular, cellular data, data allows the internet, internet, so email, so email and web browsing, to be accessed, to be accessed on, the on the phone. And for high and for security, security, it's best to turn, best to turn this, off this off for now. now. Choose, general, Choose general, then scroll, then scroll to, cellular, to cellular and turn, and this, turn off. this off. You can still you can make, still and, make and, receive and receive phone calls and text messages. messages. Click, Click back, back on general. Then back, then back to settings, settings and, and scroll, scroll up, up to Wi-Fi. Wi ensure that Wi-Fi wi wi is also switched, off, also switched off so that the internet, so that the cannot, internet be cannot be accessed by this by means. This means. Click, on wi click on Wi-Fi, then click off. Then click off. Okay, so... Um, our research showed that there was much confusion about how technology facilitated stalking was covered by the law and what protection women had when being abused and harassed via new technology. Together with a lawyer from Youth Law, we created a series of four easy legal guides that could be used by women and workers. So I'll just show you um, a screenshot of our SmartSafe website. So these can be found on smartsafe.org.au. So we've got a series of le easy legal guides there. And I'll just quickly go through one of these guides now. Um, this guide looked at examples of technology facilitated stalking and then the lawyer went through all the different aspects, um, what women could do, what were the risk factors and how she could provide evidence. So I'll just quickly go through one of these easy, easy legal guides now. So we've got here, Tara experienced many forms of domestic violence, including sexual violence from her ex-partner. He uploaded intimate videos online of her that were taken during their relationship and he's using these videos to threaten her. She does not have an intervention order and feels embarrassed to tell anyone about what has happened. So we can see here the risk factors using uh, the common risk assessment um, for CRAF. We've got the risk factors here, sexual violence, stalking and use of threats and intimidation. These all increase the risk of further violence. How can the law protect her? Tara can apply for an intervention order with a condition that the ex cannot distribute photos of her. And what evidence can be used to help her? Tara needs to keep text messages and posts on Facebook using screenshots or taking photos with her phone. Tara and any other witnesses need to write down in as much detail what they saw and heard, including times and dates. So these are just a few examples of the resources we have developed as a result of our research. 
So you can visit our, we our website, which is smartsafe.org.au, for more resources. So there's more videos there, and um, you can download our findings booklet. And uh, DVRCV also runs a more extensive course on this topic, and you can see our website there. So it's dvrcv.org.au, which fingers crossed is up at the moment. Um, we had a bit of technical difficulties this morning. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thanks to Lainey for that great presentation. It's been really informative to find out how prevalent stalking and technology is in Australia and how women can increase their safety. So we are now going to open up for a few questions for Delaney to answer. If you would like to ask a question, please do so by typing the questions into the chat box at the bottom left of your screen. Okay, so we have had a few questions come through already. Do we, we do have one question from Scott. Now Scott's question is, are there any other online resources that can help me to make smartphones safer for my clients? Um, yes, there are. There's a really great resource. I'm just going to see if I've got it open. Um, there's, so Women's Aid in the UK did a project on digital stalking and the woman who wrote that has her own website now called digitalstalking.com and it's digital, uh, yeah, I think you'll be able to search that up or maybe I can paste that in, I'm not sure. But yeah, that has a really good range of all sorts of resources. Um, how to's and we're also hoping that we will keep building on our how to videos so that will include um, at the moment we've just got iPhones so we're hoping to include more Android videos and also to have a really good how to um, keep women safe on Facebook. Great, thanks Delaney. Now we do have time for a couple more questions so just a reminder to everybody please type those into the chat box down the bottom left hand side of the screen before the webinar does end for today. We have had another question come through from Lynn and Lynn's question is, family court orders often state that parents in shared care arrangements must, within 24 hours, provide to the other party any change in phone numbers, emails, address or mobile numbers. So this gives the stalker the ability to claim contravention if the other party attempts to escape the text stalking. Is mm -hmm. there any research on women who cannot change their mobiles uh, due to family court orders? Um, not that I know of, but we did, um, as part of this research, we did consult with legal workers and also women um, in refuge, so workers in refuge, and that was a big issue that came up. Um, so some workers will have a creative way to get around that and women will have creative ways to get around that. That could be just having one phone number that that perpetrator can call. So that means she knows if a call's coming in on that, it's just from him, but she has another phone that's, you know, a phone number that's for family and friends. Um, or maybe she'll have a phone number that someone else will monitor so that she doesn't have to necessarily hear um, the abuse. Uh, she just someone can just pass on the details to her. But those are you know, the sort of things that um, we're hoping to look at more in the future. There's some great suggestions there. Thanks, Delaney. Um, now we do have another question come through from Krista. What trends are you observing in tech-related stalking and how tech-savvy are perpetrators? Um, look, I guess like as our research showed, it, the mostly used technology was text messaging. So, it's not necessarily the kind of really covert kind of stuff, you know, sticking GPS tracking on cars or anything like that. However, as I mentioned earlier, um, in the US, it's, we can see that GPS tracking is increasingly being used there. And so we're kind of assuming that that will start to happen here more and more. Um, so those are the kinds of trends that we might be able to expect in Australia. Yeah. Great. We have had another question come through from Natalie. Are there uh, things we can do for non-smartphones to address the texting issues? Um, look, I think you can contact service providers uh, here. So, say Telstra, you can um, block a number, but it is really difficult. And it was really difficult on iPhones until recently with the latest update. They've now got an update that you can quite easily block text messages. Um, but on you know non-smartphones, I think it's actually really difficult unless you contact your service provider. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, we've got 
One more question here from Brooke. Um, now, a number of legal services in the Northern Territory have noticed an increase in revenge porn where ex-partners mm. post images of women online. Have you had any experience trying to re remove dedicated revenge porn websites? Um, I don't have any experience in that um, personally, but I know that um, quite a bit of research has been done in the US and the UK looking at that issue. Um, so mostly what we saw was, um, you know, women were being threatened with this kind of thing, which was part of that sort of controlling tactic. Um, and yes, some women did have you know, YouTube videos put up of them and um, videos being sent to family and friends. Um, so that is something we're seeing increasingly. And, and no, I don't think there are any easy answers as to how to get those pictures down. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Delaney. Um, just as a reminder to everybody, we do have a couple more uh, minutes in the webinar. So if you have got any questions there, please do type them into the chat box down the bottom left. We have another question there from Bernadette. Um, has there been any research on women using the telecommunication laws and men being charged? Mm. Um, anecdotally, we heard from some police that um, they were using they had success using um, a law, the, um, using a carriage service to abuse or harass. Um, other than that, I haven't heard of that many successful prosecutions of um, how perpetrators are using the technology, other than you know maybe intervention order breaches. Um, so there hasn't been any research done on that, no. Okay, thanks Delaney. Thanks. Um, now just while we're uh, waiting for a few more questions to come through, I might just take this time to talk about the next webinar. Now we are very, very excited to have the eminent Elizabeth Broderick, who is the Sex Discrimination Commissioner from the Australian Human Rights Commission. She will be presenting the next webinar that's held on Thursday the 29th of May in just a couple of uh, days next week. Um, now we have, if you haven't already registered for that webinar, the link to register is on the 1800 Respect website. And you also will, will receive an email uh, to register for that this afternoon. We have got time for one more question. So we've got a question from Jessica. Is Facebook prompt to remove any inappropriate content when requested? Do they review content regularly themselves? Um, look, I don't know that. Um, from, I'm trying to, uh, from what I've heard, I don't know whether they are that responsive. Um, however, they do work very closely with an organisation in the US called Safety Net, which is um, run by the National Network to End Domestic Violence there. And they do work very closely with them to look at ways in which they can help keep women safe who are experiencing domestic violence on Facebook. So um, hopefully that is getting easier and um, quicker for women. Yes. Now on behalf of the entire 1800 Respect team, I thank you for attending this webinar and hope you have found it very valuable. Please stay online to take our quick survey. Thank you.